All right, everybody, welcome back. And we have a repeat offender here, Jorn Lomberg uh, from the Copenhagen Consensus Center. Jorn, thanks so much for being back on. Hey, Dan, it's great to be back. So um, you're back because you're an environmentalist, and uh, but you're a rational environmentalist. That's what I call myself. I think we should all be environmentalists. Uh, you, uh, you know, we. I think we, last time we talked, we talked about your book, False Alarm, um, which I guess if I had to summarize it, um, you know, it's it's you always get at the cost benefit ratio. I think when it comes to to climate change policy, I mean, not that we shouldn't address it, not that it's not real. We're not having that debate. The debate we're having is what we should do about it and what makes sense and what doesn't. And um, as we all expected, uh, as soon as uh, Biden took over, um, a lot of a uh, flurry of executive actions came about. And there's there's obviously, it's pretty obvious that the, that the way they believe in tackling climate change is along the framework of a Green New Deal, uh, which is which if I had to describe what that means, I, I would say it's a almost religious adherence to solar and wind and renewables as the only way to battle climate change. And a lot of things that feel good, but don't necessarily do any good. And uh, so we'll, we'll chat today about what those mean, what they don't mean, and what better solutions might be. So yeah, I mean, thanks for coming on. And how you been? I've been good. I've been busy. I've uh, been locked in. It's cold here. I'm in Sweden right now. So uh, it's good. I'm, uh, I'm a little envious of where you are. Oh yeah, it's at, we're in the '60s here, sunny Houston, Texas. It's great. <laughs> we love it. Uh, but I got to go to yeah. DC tomorrow, it's and um, it's, it's snowing. Frost, frosty here. Yeah. Yes. I don't mind a little snow. You know, the, the, what I really hate is um, cold weather where it's not, but it's not quite snowing. It's just, it's just cold rain. So that's the worst. I, I assume Sweden yeah. at least it's snowy, yeah. but I could be wrong. Well. No, mostly it's just crappy. So yeah, <laughs> come in the summer, it's beautiful. Winter, not so much. It's the time to be there. Um, so I mean, so yeah, I mean, what do you what do you think? Um, you know, just what's your immediate reaction to the start of the new year? How how are we doing? Are we on a good track here? <laughs> well, so f fundamentally, as as you pointed out, look, you got to recognize that global warming, like any other problem, you have to fix it smartly, and that's about finding out. Where can you spend little money and do a lot of good before you start spending lots and lots of money and do almost no good? Uh, and as you point out, yes, the Green New Deal has this tendency to be, let's do everything. It kind of makes sense if you believe global warming is the end of the world. If you really think this is sort of a an oncoming asteroid that's hurtling toward Earth, you, know, you got to send uh, Bruce Willis and everybody up there and, and dismantle it and quick. And yeah. you know, cost is just not an objective. But that's not what global warming is. Global warming is a problem. It's a long-term problem. The UN Climate Panel tells us global warming will cost, by the end of the century, maybe 3 4% of our income. So we'll be 3 to 4% less well-off than we other would, otherwise would have been. Remember, by then we'll be about 450% richer. So it's not like this is going to be a big deal, but it's, it is going to be a deal. It's and it is yeah. a problem. But... You know, if you end up spending to fix a three or four percent problem, if you end up spending what you know sixteen percent, that's a bad idea. Then you've yeah. actually, you know, uh, in in some sense, you've you've spent you've cut off your your arm to cure a wrist ache. That's a really bad idea. And I think Green New Deal and and Biden's policies is a little bit of smart and a lot of spending that's not going to be very smart and 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 some of it that that we know is just bad spending and, and so the reality and what i think we should have a conversation about is say look global warming is real yeah let's fix the smart stuff but let's not throw enormous amounts of money behind something that'll fix almost nothing yeah and it's not clear to me what that money is going to go towards yet i mean what they started with was more mandates um <clears throat> you know uh, banning the, the the first big ones, banning the Keystone Pipeline, banning uh, new leases on federal lands. So this is a direct attack, an ideological attack, really, against the oil and gas industry uh, itself. And and so, the, you know, again, the question is, what is that going to do for the environment? Um, what's it going to do for jobs? What's what's the cost benefit ratio here? And, and it is important to start with. Uh, with with your analogy, I'm like, look, if there's a meteor coming and we have to send Bruce Willis, then we have to send Bruce Willis. 
But this is, and that is the important place to stop, start because we're not necessarily debating whether some kind of climate change is real. But once we agree on that, we do have to have a realistic conversation about what it really means. And it, you, and, and if, you know, I, I think anxiety levels amongst children these days are going up uh, precipitously because they're taught to believe that they're going to die. I, I mean, this is, this is immoral, first of all, I think, to be teaching children this. And it's just not true. It's like, okay, so the sea levels rise very slowly over the course of 100 years. You might have some beachfront property that's no longer beachfront property. Um, you might have more rain and less rain in certain places. I mean, there's going to be changes. Um, but obviously, we adapt to those changes just like humans have always adapted. I've also, um, I'll never forget this, uh, Orrin Cass did a great job debunking this this notion of, uh, because a lot of the costs associated with um, the cost of climate change turn out to be cost in human life, meaning cost in heat death. But when you actually dig into these statistics, as it turns out, they're assuming basically that nobody will ever adapt to heat. And so, so here's, and let me, let me lay this out real quick. I'm kind of going on a tangent, but I, but I just want to hit this point that you made. So this is basically what they're assuming. In 100 years, if, if the world heats up, Philadelphia would be as hot as Houston, okay? And then they assume that because Philadelphia would be as hot as Houston in a hundred years, that heat deaths would increase like 50 fold. But that doesn't make any sense. Like we all know that that wouldn't happen because obviously if we're surviving just fine in Houston, people in Philadelphia are going to survive just fine as well. Like it's just not true, you know, just, it, and, and it's really easy to debunk these claims. And so Frankly, I question even the four to five percent decrease in wealth because, I, you know, it's because of statistical errors like that um, and analytical errors, really. Um, they're very dishonest. So, yeah, it's important to know. It doesn't mean we don't have an interest in, in just cleaner air, cleaner energy. I think we do, um, which, of course, you agree with. The question is um, the cost benefit. So, um Anyway, long tangent, but let, let, let's get. Can, go can I just respond to some of it? Yeah, you went out on a tangent. I'll just you know because a lot of people sort of tend to say, why on earth would it be true that we are right now living at the best temperature of the world, so that if it gets a little warmer, it'll be suddenly worse? But you've just made that point essentially. Every place has been constructed to live where. The temperature was the last 100, 200 years. So, you know, Houston is good with heat and Philadelphia or Seattle is good with you know, relative cold. And both of these places would have an extra cost if you make it warmer or if you made it colder. You know, we've simply constructed the world such that it's adapted to what the climate used to be the last couple of hundred years with all our infrastructure. But it also points out, as you just point, said, you know, it's not the end of the world. It is a, you know, a change that will have costs. You will need more air conditioning in, in uh, Philadelphia. You may need to change some of your houses. You, you will need to adapt to you know, rising sea levels, but we know how to do that incredibly cheaply, and we have 80 years to do so. So yes, this is a cost, but it's not the end of the world. And I think that's what we should teach our kids not only because it's true and because it's immoral to you know, scare them witless, but also just imagine all the the opportunity that goes lost if you know kids are saying why should i study you know there'll not be a, a future for me in 30 years no there's going to be lots of future and you should study exactly because you should fix global warming and all the other problems in the world right yeah i think my friends across the aisle they, they tend to overstate problems and then and then use that overstatement to justify the most extreme solutions possible and i would say that climate change is one of many issues that this that this happens with um, but it, it's bad policy making. It's it's bad governing. It's 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 not why you should be elected. Um, so I mean, let's just start then, I guess, with um, again, and I think you wrote about this. Uh, you know, Joe Biden's climate change plans will burn billions, but they won't bring change we we actually need. Uh, you wrote about that in the New York Post. And you know, so so why is that? I mean, like you know, what what happens if we just eliminate the oil and gas industry in Texas and in the United States? Is this is this going to make all of our weather like San Diego? I mean, what's going? You know, I mean, what's the benefit <laughs> well, here? I I think and and you know, surprisingly, I don't know if you saw uh, John Kerry actually admitted as much. If the U.S. Yeah. ripped out every 
uh, you know, fossil fuel emitting property. If we stopped all cars, stopped all industry, stopped being cool in Houston or warm in Philadelphia, if we stop all of that tomorrow and for the rest of the century, which of course would be a huge problem for the U.S. and, and lead to countless uh, uh, misery. If you did all that, you almost wouldn't be able to see the difference in 100 years. So the UN climate models show that by the end of the century, we would probably see a reduction in temperature of somewhere between 0 .0 to 0 0.2, sorry, 0 0.2 to 0 0.3 degrees Fahrenheit. I'm, I'm sorry, I'm used to thinking in Celsius. So the, the idea here is, yes, you would see a tiny difference, but not very much. And that, of course, indicates, and, and you know, he almost kind of got that, this is not about getting the U.S. to change primarily. It's about making sure we get everyone on the planet to change. And while you know, rich, well-meaning Californians may be willing to say, all right, we'll pay twice or triple uh, the electricity cost of what normal people do, uh, you're not likely get, to get most Chinese or Indians or Africans or Latin Americans to say yes to that. And that's the real trick here is to recognize that there is no way you can just spend lots of money, even in the U.S., and make a measurable impact. This has to be about the planet, and that means this has to be affordable. Yeah, and you know, you keep hearing that. It's like, well, okay, fine. We'll admit that it's not going to do a whole lot if we just – and that's if we stopped admitting right now. I mean, I think, you know, it, that's <laughs> – that's that's if you take extreme action, then it then it has that like tiny little effect. I've I've seen some other uh, uh, um, statistics that you put in your book, and I think if all of the developed countries stopped emitting right now, I mean just stopped right now, basically we stopped existing, then you might see a 0.8 degree decrease. Is that Celsius or yeah. okay? But still, that's it's Fahrenheit, like so, 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 so oh, Fahrenheit, so it's even less. I mean, so that's. That's crazy. So you, you just have to take a step back. You just have to take a step back yeah. and say, like, what are we doing, guys? I mean, what on earth are we doing? So, so you're, you're gonna, you're, you're, with all this virtue signaling, the Chinese are gonna be like, I get it now. I just, I get it. You know, let's, <laughs> let's. But I mean, but, but actually, they I, do. I was they, just, what, I, go ahead. Actually, I was just on NPR a couple of hours ago, and I was debating this other guy. Uh, uh, and he was, you know, very eloquently arguing for, look, it's going to create all these jobs and it's going to do all this great for, 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 you know, all dispossessed people. And it's going to be, you know, uh, great to get all the labor movements going and stuff. And I was waiting for him to come back and say, and it's going to be good for the climate. But that sort of never came. I'm sure that, you know, I'm sure that was part of his motivation. But there seems to be this sense in which this is good for everything. And you almost seem to be forgetting no, fundamentally, this is going to be costly. I mean, if it was great without climate change, we would have done this a long time ago. We would have switched over even if there was no climate legislation or a Paris agreement or anything. Of course, this is going to be costly. Of course, it's going to make it harder to produce stuff, to be able to drive around, to be able to do all the things you want to do. Now, that may still be fine because you're also getting climate benefits, but surely you need to sort of weigh those to each other. And there is no sense in much of this conversation about what it is that we're really trying to achieve. You're trying to achieve a lot of different things and many of them at very high cost with very little benefits. That's just not the right way to go forward. Well, also, and if it's hard to make the case that it's actually environmentally beneficial, I, I, I would call him a complete liar, whoever this guy was, when it comes to saying that it's economically beneficial and all these great new jobs are going to be created. Look, on average, the solar and wind job pays about $20,000 less per year than an oil and gas job. There's less of them. Uh, you know, look, if, if you care about the environment, I'm always saying invest in nuclear. Um, and by the way, it takes about a thousand people to operate a nuclear plant. Uh, you're not you're not devastating acres and acres and acres of wildlife just to build a nuclear plant. And uh, it takes about six people to operate a solar panel uh, farm. So um, just in, in ter if, if you're going to make the argument about jobs, then let's see, you have less of them and they don't pay as well. Uh, and also most of those jobs are in China because they're the ones manufacturing it because they're the only ones who can do it cheap enough because they have no labor regulations and no environmental regulations. That's the other dirty little secret about about renewables. Um, I, I guess one thing I, I always say and I want you to respond to is is um, oil and gas industry in in the U.S. is 
is by far the cleanest production of oil and gas. And if you know for a fact that that energy demand around the world is going to be 20 to 30 percent higher in the next 20 years, you know, somebody's going to have to produce energy, right? Because you know, African countries, developing countries, they have a moral obligation to get their citizens out of poverty. Um, they're going to do it one way or the other. And uh, they're, they're not as concerned as John Kerry is with pleasing European diplomats. Uh, your Europeans are very nice, but I, for some reason, John Kerry really likes your diplomats and they want to please them. So they went back into the Paris Climate Accord. That's my, <laughs> that's the only reason I can think of as to why they go back into the Paris Climate Agreement. Um, but African countries don't care about that as much. Um, they, 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 they have different priorities, usually like food and clean water and, and just jobs and just surviving. Um, same with many other countries. So, you know, what I'm, the argument I'm always making is somebody's going to provide that energy. It should be us. And if you, if, and if you see dominance to Russia, Saudi Arabia, Venezuela, Iran, you actually stand to increase global emissions. I mean, just, I, I don't see any, any other way out of that. Would you agree with that? Is that a decent argument to make? Is it more complicated than that? I I, th I think it's certainly a decent argument. I mean, if you look at we we started off talking about the uh, uh, the Keystone uh, and Obama's own analysis showed that Keystone the completion of Keystone would increase emissions m trivially or very very marginally because. If you don't buy it from the Canadians, you will buy it from somewhere else. Now, the Canadian oil, as we know, is actually a little more in, intensive in, in, in production, uh, which is one of the reasons you can argue that it's a little better, but not very much. And, mm -hmm. and you're absolutely right that we'll have a lot of Chinese, a lot of Indians, and certainly a lot of Africans who, are want, who will want to be able to pull their po uh, populations out of poverty with any kind of available energy. And that means that they are gonna use coal instead of American gas. That is a huge negative for the environment. It's also actually a huge negative for the local environment in Africa or in, 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 uh, in India. So clearly there are arguments to say that we should recognize if you're gonna burn fossil fuel, remember right now about 80% of the world is fossil fuel. Uh, and even if we manage to do amazingly well, it is very likely by 2040, it'll be still be about 74% uh, fossil fuels. We have no sense of how hard it is to change this whole super tanker of, of, of global energy. If we're still gonna be using lots of fossil fuels, let's make sure we use the most effective. On the jobs part, um, I think there's a lot of misinformation going around. If you ask most economists, they'll tell you, and I think it's very bluntly obvious, that if you get a, if you buy a lot of extra green jobs, you're going to lose about just as many jobs in terms of dollars. So you know if they're better paid or worse paid, overall you lose about the same uh, salary payment from other jobs because you have to subsidize these green jobs. You have to eventually tax other businesses more, and that leads to fewer jobs. Uh, you know, there's this one wonderful statistic that for the energy that one person can produce in natural gas in the US, you need 38 people in the solar uh, industry. Many people sort of suggest, see how wonderful we're creating 38 jobs. But an economist would argue, well, no, you're getting 38 people to do what one person could have done. Those 37 other people could have been nurses and uh, you know, working on roads or, or taking care of our kids or you know, teachers or all the other productive jobs that we could have had in our world. It is not just about getting more jobs. You can, of course, just pay people for jobs. But if it means that they are doing less productive things than more productive things, you have lost opportunity in your society. So at the end of the day, this is about recognizing it's not about jobs, it's about paying more to cut carbon emissions. Now that may be fine, but again, then we're back to saying, how much do you pay for this? And how much good do you do for the world in terms of reducing temperatures? And that's where we get back to saying you end up you know, spending trillions and cutting virtually indistinguishable, uh, temp getting virtually indistinguishable temperature reductions. Yeah. And there's a lot, a lot, a lot of directions I want to go with what you just said. The other thing I would point out again is, you know, I'm not sure where they get that statistics of, of, of 38 to one. It's probably some clever analytics there, um, but also those those jobs on average pay a lot less. Like again, twenty thousand dollars on average less. So it's 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 just, it's a huge deal. Um, 
And then, and then what are you getting for? So, so we've already kind of gone over the, the environmental impact and what you, what you get for that from a climate change perspective. It turns out that there's a lot of other environmental impacts, rare earth mineral mining, again, shipping solar panels and wind turbines from China back to the U S um, and then the, the, the clearing out large swaths of land to build these things. Um, and then you have intermittent energy that's not a base load power source. So it's like, I always wonder what, what I'm thinking of solar wind. Again, I'm not against solar wind. I think it makes sense if the environment is correct for it, if the situation is, is correct for it, um, which isn't always. And so I, I don't think it ever reaches this panacea that everybody thinks it will. Um, and then like you, you can compare Germany and, and France, for instance. So, I mean, maybe talk about the, the, uh, the difference there and, and the, the experience of Germany and France with their power sources. Well, I mean, fundamentally, France went nuclear a long time ago, back in the 70s, uh, and they have very cheap power, uh, whereas Germany was mostly fossil fuels, mostly coal, uh, and they have gone all in for solar and wind. Uh, but at the same time, they got rid of their last nuclears because they got they got worried after Fukushima in 2011. Uh, so what has actually happened is they have gotten more uh, renewables. They've gotten rid of their uh, CO2 free nuclear power. And that means they have now also to use more fossil fuels. So the outcome is they have much more expensive uh, uh, electricity, but they've only cut their emissions a tiny bit. That's obviously one of the worst outcomes. But frustratingly, it's not Germany most people are criticizing. It's France because they shouldn't have nuclear power. France is actually thinking about scrapping a lot of their nuclear power and going renewable. And then, of course, they get the exact problem you are just talking about. What do you do with intermittency? So the, the simple point here is to recognize two things. One is solar and wind is good at small amounts. So, you know, solar especially can cover because it'll typically only be on hot days when the sun is shining a lot. It can actually cover the peak load of your air conditioning. That makes a lot of sense. You actually can make money off of just putting up solar panels. Of course, then people will actually do this. You don't need to subsidize them uh, for doing this. So you can shave off some of the cost of peak production. That's great. But you will never get to solve most of the electricity problem because what do you then do when the sun is not shining or the wind is not blowing and it suddenly becomes very, very expensive? The second point is to re recognize that electricity is the easy part. It's only about a third of all emissions globally. You know, it's what do you do about cars? What do you do about steel? What do you do about cement? What do you do about the whole agricultural situation, fertilizer, all these other things where we have very, very few solutions to huge parts of the problem. So in some sense, we're very fascinated with this solar and wind that can solve a part of the easy bit of the problem. But that's, I mean, that's no way to get to zero. That's a way to get to a little bit. Yeah, I, I like a part in your book um, about how climate change policies increase climate change. You know, there's there's a lot of great just fact checks here that, that people need to understand. Um, I don't know, if, did you write about ethanol? I have in my notes here, uh, some crazy statistics on ethanol. And like, I, I wanna run these by you because I think I want to make sure these are right. The World Bank reported that this decision to require ethanol and fuel um, catapulted 100 million people around the world into poverty, 44 million people into extreme poverty, 30 million people into a, a, the designation of hunger. So, I mean, that's a, that's intense. Is that is that yeah pass muster here? So, Why so, is that? So, I mean, these these are, these are model estimates because obviously you can't actually see who got. Uh, uh, influenced by uh, by ethanol. But the fundamental point is that we're right now using a lot of land to grow food that we feed our cars. That's just, you know, it just feels wrong when you, when you say it out loud. In a world where about 900 million people are still starving every, uh, every day, maybe there would be better use for that food uh, 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 for, for that growth. Uh, but also we of course need to recognize that if we want to go further, you know, most people see wind and solar as the big things that are gonna actually uh, uh, fix our clim uh, climate and cut our carbon emissions. But most places it is actually, and so in the EU for instance, two thirds, about one third comes from solar and wind, but two thirds come from biomass. 
So, you know, essentially foodstuffs or just wood that we grow to burn. Why? Because that we can burn when we need it rather than when the sun is shining or the wind is blowing. So it's much more convenient. But of course, what it does is it leads to enormous land use. Now, we've restricted that because we realize, oh, my God, it's not a good idea to get 100 million people uh, become hungry. But what is really happening behind the facade, and we know that this is one of the challenges that we're going to see in the next 10 years or so, is as you push your targets, it becomes very hard not to just use more and more of your land for uh, 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 essentially for biomass because it's so easy to put in and it's so easy to call it CO2 neutral. There are all kinds of problems with whether it's actually CO2 neutral, but much more that mostly means it drives up food prices and that will hurt the poor. So when you're being all virtues and cutting your carbon emissions, it's very likely that you're actually also helping make food more expensive, make more poor people starve more, and at the same time taking away land from nature and putting it into agriculture. Those are probably not things you want to happen, and those are generally not good things. Yeah, and they don't do much for the environment either. Again, like that's that's the real kicker. Oh, um, and, and, and a burning biomass, burning wood, that's not that's definitely not carbon neutral. Uh, but but Germany does it to an extraordinary extent. It, it's a kind of it's a very confusing. Uh, policy when people hear about it you're like you're like you kind of screech to a halt and say wait 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 a second what but that's how, that's how they're yeah. claiming it's green the, energy the, because the argument, burning wood <laughs> the argument is that you burn this wood you emit more co2 than coal in the process but you also plant a new tree that will eventually suck up that co2 now that's a very are you going to <laughs> or is it going to get cut down a, a lot sooner but even if you do most of it will only be sucked up in 50 or 100 years. So you've essentially just emitted a lot of extra CO2, felt very virtuous about it, about yourself, and promised that most of it will be back in the new tree within the next 100 years. Really? It's crazy. So because you, you could just use it for timber, too. Like you could, you, if you just build furniture out of it or houses out of it, yep. you don't release any CO2. It's like, the, the, like people don't, you know, it only releases out of wood if you burn it. So just don't burn it. <laughs> I mean, you could still cut it down and replant trees. I mean, I don't know. I'm not a, I'm not a rocket scientist or anything, but it just, it just seems like there's such better ways to do this. I mean, do you ever think about the psychology of the people you're debating with? Because these are smart people. You know, they know the facts. They must know the facts. So where does this religious adherence to renewables come from? Again, I'm not against them. I, th I think they're nice. They make sense. If they make sense, depends, again, on the situation. But it almost seems like they... It's not even about climate change for them. There, there's certainly a lot of, of, you know, of psychology and and you call it virtue signaling, you know, that I want to be good. So that's why I'm supporting this uh, solar panel and wind turbine. I think that most of the people I talk to uh, and debate, they are incredibly worried. And then we're back to that uh, uh, yeah. meteor. They feel like we've seen the meteor and it's coming right at us. And why aren't you willing to do everything you possibly can and also squeeze out the last trillion on this? Now, when you then actually talk to them, they're not doing that, right? Because if they really were that worried, they would be building nuclear power plants. Now, the, the reason why I don't think that's a big solution right now is because in most of the industrialized world, it's actually pretty damn expensive. Uh, yeah. So we still need to find cheaper ways of building maybe fourth generation nuclear. Maybe that could be the solution. But if you really were all that worried, you build a lot of nuclear plants and get us pretty much off fossil fuels in a few short decades. But we're not doing that. I, I always find it really surprising that the people who are very, very scared are essentially saying, I'm terribly scared, so scared that I'm going to use the same policies that have failed for the last 30 years, but have cost a lot of money. That's probably not the right solution. And and I don't, I can't tell you if I if I knew sort of the trick to, you know, sort of get them out of the trance, I, I would tell you, I would love to know what that is. I don't know what that is, but it's very clear that if we as a human society really thought this was a big issue, we would fix it smartly. If we thought it was a, you know, a, a, a middle middling problem, as I'm arguing and uh, as I think most of the data shows, we would solve it smartly as a middling issue. But we seem to be saying 
it's a big issue. Let's spend big bucks on it. Let's not actually fix it. That's kind of lose, lose, lose. That's not a very good outcome. Yeah, it's weird. I'm, I'm always analyzing the psychology of it. I, I can't figure it out either. Um, if I could, then yeah, you would, you would understand what the, what the right argument is, is to make there. I, I almost, I, I think it's a, I, I look, I, I think half the human race for as long as the human race has existed, um, believes in, in utopia. And I think half the human race doesn't, you know, there's, it's just, I think there's two different states of mind, just generally speaking, um, and, and one is a, is a bit more content with like, look, understanding that there are things we just can't control. And the other side believes in sort of this utopia that they, that, that they'll get to and they'll kill themselves to get it. and They'll kill everybody else to get there. Um, and it's, I don't think it's healthy, uh, but it's, it's, it's just a totally different way of thinking. And I think there's, I think some people just envision, uh, like literally a world where we consume nothing. You know, the thing is, is like to get there and these are this, you know, it's like people don't understand where things are made from and why you have things at all. You know, it's nice that you can go backpacking for five, six days at a time and and be one with nature, but you're really not like you're using a North Face jacket (laughs) and a Patagonia jacket. They're really good at virtue signaling to you, but they use petrochemicals to make their jackets. Everything that you're using to survive in the wild has come from thousands of years of inventions and, and, and production and development. And you just and, and like, just acknowledging that would be really healthy, but people won't even acknowledge it. It's like, you, you know, just acknowledge the trade-offs, please. Just so we can start to have a rational conversation. And, um, and I know you, yeah. you talk about this a lot. Let's, like, let's focus on things that are more tangible, like overfishing, like, like, like clean water, clean rivers, plastic and rivers. These are more tangible things maybe. Most people who have solar panels uh, are very, very virtuous about it. And they're saying, see how much it saves me, although much of that comes from subsidies from everybody else. So it's typically subsidies from poor people to the rich people who could afford the uh, solar panels. Uh, But the reality, of course, is most people with solar panels actually use the coal-fired power plants when it's dark or when their batteries run out. They are very, very happy to have that backup power because very few people actually want to live on solar panels alone 24-7. And that's exactly the point. We have no idea of how much of our society is backed up by lots of power and lots of other things. And so, again, that gets to the point of saying, you know, uh, a lot of the people who are very involved in climate want to do good. I actually think, and I don't know, maybe it's different in, in, in the U.S., but my sense is that most people in politics want to do good. But I think also everyone recognize you can't do all good at one time. And what I'm surprised about is that so many people of goodwill have decided the one thing I want to do is try and fix climate change really badly and ineffectively, rather than having a discussion about saying what would actually help the world. We've talked about some of the things that, uh, like, for instance, being able to supply fracked gas to a lot of the world, not just from the US, but also actually get China to do its own fracking and so on. That would be immensely helpful in many different ways. And of course, there are many, many other problems that have nothing to do with climate. So you know, you, you mentioned that a lot of people are poor and don't have access to clean drinking water and their kids starve and die from easily curable infectious diseases. There's a host of issues around the world. And I'm just a little surprised that we're so focused on this one thing where we can do almost nothing at very high cost compared to all the other problems where we could help so much more at lower cost. Yeah. Like you said, it's, it's, it's about, it's, it's always about what are you getting for that $1 spent? I mean, I think you wrote a whole book about this, right? Or like what to do with 75, how to spend $75 billion. And, um, you know, I, I, I'm less, uh, uh, I'm less generous with, with, uh, with reading my political opponent's intent, I think than I used to be. Um, because you, you, after you've put the facts in front of people so many times and they still want you to go down this extremely destructive path, and it just turns out that going down that destructive path allows them to control many, many policies, um, on many, many levels, it does start to seem to me that it's more about control than it is about helping the environment. Um, you know, the Green New Deal being, uh, being a big example of that. And I, I don't like assuming bad intentions. But I, but I'm not sure what choice I have after after seeing this over and over and over again. 
Um, and the other thing about the reason they can do that too is because, well, <laughs> climate change is kind of, you, you can continue to move the goalposts. It's like, it, it's the ideal problem for them. It's the, it's the ideal crisis because it's never solved. Like you'll never know, you're always basing it off of models and they're always quick to blame every single hurricane on it and then claim it's a disaster. But of course there's no scientific way to, to connect those two things. Um, and so it's never ending. It's a never ending problem that they can continue to chase and continue to put their preferred policies uh, attached to it. And so it's, I, I, again, it's, that's a really cynical way of looking at it, but I don't know how else to look at it these days. All I can say is, is look, I'm going to continue to to show the facts. And it's like, if this is indeed your goal, and I agree, it's a good goal. The hmm. goal being, look, just a, a a reasonable reduction in emissions, and and an, imp- an improvements to the environment, clean air and water. Right? If that's your goal, then let's do it this way, based on this reasoning. And if you have different reasoning, by all means, make a reasonable argument with facts and data. But that doesn't happen. It's very frustrating. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, and, and I think that's exactly right. That that is what that is the conversation we should have. Uh, a, again, I think it's partly this catastrophizing. Uh, I think it's very healthy sometimes to just go back a little bit and realize we've been told this for a long time by a lot of really smart people that the world is going to end for a variety of different reasons. Uh, you know, uh, one of my favorites was the UN uh, told told us back in the uh, late eighties that uh, by if we didn't fix climate change before the end of the century, the impact would be just as devastating as nuclear war uh, by 2000. Mind yeah. you. Hmm, no, didn't happen. And there are lots of these sorts of, uh, of claims. So again, it's, it's valuable to understand that, you know, if you're really scared, you're likely to make bad decisions. And, you know, I think we should help talk people out of that. But you also need to recognize that currently we're not spending money very well. And, and you know, again, back to the Biden's promises. If you look at what he's actually promising, he's talking about spending two trillion dollars over the next four years. Now, granted, he'll probably not get all of that through uh, Congress. But if he were to spend that much money, first of all, it'd be fifteen hundred dollars per person in the U.S. every year. That's a lot of money. Remember, the Washington Post uh, uh, in in a recent survey showed that a majority of Americans are not willing to pay twenty four dollars to fix climate change per year. So, you know, spending an inordinately larger amount, fifteen hundred dollars every year is likely to not make this sustainable. You just simply can't spend that much money. And then he's talking about spending it on building a million electrified American cars, clearly something that feels very, very good and you know, possibly something you can be proud about and say, see, sh- show people, see we're doing something about the climate crisis. But of course, actually supporting electric cars we know is one of the most costly ways to cut carbon emissions or basically you could cut about 10 to 100 times more CO2 for the same amount of money. That's a really, really bad way to try and help the environment. Uh, Likewise, he wants to weatherize homes. And we know we have the biggest study in the US, actually in the world, but from the US, showing that the average weatherizing of homes end up being much more expensive and saving less than what you expect. So unlike most of the prognoses that tell you, oh, you're gonna save lots of money, it turns out that every dollar spent will only save about 50 cents. We know this already. And so spending hundreds of trillion, sorry, hundreds of billions of dollars on these programs will cut little, provide fairly little benefits. That's a bad idea. So again, there is one good thing, and let me just end on, on the positive note. He's also talking about spending a lot more money on research and development into green energy. And that could be really useful. A little bit like Kennedy decided to go to the moon. You know, sure, there might not be all that much to go to the moon, but you get all this great stuff from innovation, from deciding to go there. You know, the the slogan is you got Velcro. Uh, But, you know, you get all these different other opportunities. And if we go for a lot of green energy of innovation, not only do we actually have a, a play at getting really, really cheap energy, which would, of course, be, be a boon both for the U.S., especially for the rest of the world, but we also get 
bigger and better batteries, no, sorry, smaller and better batteries for our cell phones and all these other things as, as spinoffs. So this could actually be one of the places where he decides he could spend money and do an amazing amount of good because at the end we could make energy so cheap, green energy so cheap that everybody would want it. So, you know, there's a little bit of good and a lot of not very good in the spending. And that's, of course, where we need to sort of whittle it down and say, look, let's do the really smart stuff and let's not do the dumb stuff. Yeah, you know, the, the outcome needs to be lower emissions. See, this is the this is their problem. That's not actually their outcome, their desired outcome. Because if it was, they'd be, you know, and, and there's bipartisan legislation introduced by me um, and passed by me um, into law, by, you know, that, that focuses on carbon capture technology and carbon utilization. So, you know, you, you've got to look at this as a commodity and not a not a pollute, and, um, uh, it, which it can be. I mean, carbon is, is used for a variety of things, a variety of processes. You could store it and sell it and 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 you don't need to have mandates in place, which are just inefficient in general. Um, you know, there's, again, there's smart ways to do this. I'm, again, I'm a big fan of, of nuclear and, and proposing uh, better ways to make it cheaper, uh, however that may be. I mean, even if it's just allowing a higher higher um, you know, higher levels of enriched uranium to be used, like we use in the Navy. You know, I'm like, in the Navy, we use up to 90% enrichment and it's extremely efficient and powerful, but, you know, in the civilian sector, it's like 3%. Um, granted, 90% is weapon grades. That's why we don't use it. That's why we don't allow it in the civilian. But there's, you know, let's at least talk about some some better ideas. The, the, the technology's out there. It is very expensive, but it's also baseload energy, you know, and you can't mm-hmm. get around this fact. I don't care how how much better renewables get. There, there is a, a physical limit to them just by their very nature. And it, it, you can only advance it so much. Um, you brought up uh, electric cars, and uh, this is big in the news lately because GM says that we're we're going to have all electric cars by I don't know what, what was it 2050 Some, something kind of ridiculous. And I'm just very skeptical of this. Um, and there was a there was a press conference with GM recently, and they're talking about the Chevy Bolt. And um, then, then they asked them, and they're plugging it in, and they're really proud of themselves. And then they asked them, okay, well, what what kind of power source is, is this grid on? How is it charging? And they're like, ah, oh, it's about 95% coal up here in Michigan. Okay. Um, and and that could, not, not everywhere is that the case, but it is the case that if it's a mostly coal-powered grid, which is a lot of places, it's certainly the case in China, um, then electric vehicles are actually, actually emit more carbon over their lifetimes. Now, for the most part, on average, they do not emit more carbon. I, I'm not, I, I know that's a bit of a myth busting that, that's occurred and a bit of a debate, but they certainly emit more carbon just by producing them. Right. And, and then and then the next question is, OK, even if we got everybody on on electric cars, you have the stat in, in your book. Um, if we reached 130 million electric cars by 2030, I don't know what, what change that is from now, but you say we'd only reach 0.4 percent of global emissions. So, again, it's like. That's not yeah. 0.4 degrees. That's not. That's just 0.4 percent of total global emissions. So, yeah. again, it's like wow, a ton of cost. What are we getting for it? A car that we can't take on a road trip. That's what we're getting for it. Yeah. So, so again, you know, the electric car can be really great. Uh, depending on what you need for it, if you have uh, a society that more and more goes towards Uber, uh, you can have a situation where you know the cars will just go and recharge themselves and and at uh, convenient times, and maybe that could actually work out as a good uh, as a good opportunity. You can envision this happening in the long run. So over the next 10, 20, 30 years, a lot of people are going to switch to electric cars. Some people are definitely not, as you just mentioned. You know, you you can't go long. What do you going to do if you have to charge even you know a, a fast charge you basically have to you know expect like half an hour what, what are you going to do uh that's that's no fun to sit around and wait or you know have a snack as as uh, as the uh, uh advertisers for the um for the electric cars tell you uh so so there's a lot of problems and of course how are you going to do this for the commercial trucking how are you going to do this for a lot of other places where the costs are much greater and where the cost of also just simply losing the time uh from recharging is almost uh, uh makes this almost impossible again we're smart species we're probably Probably going to solve most of these problems, but there's something dramatically wrong about this idea of saying we're going to outlaw 
uh, as California has said, we're going to outlaw uh, 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 electric cars in uh, uh, 2035. Look, cars, we yeah. should make electric cars really, really smart and cheap because then most people will buy them. That will be great. But let's make sure we only do it once it's actually smarter and greater and people want that rather than saying when you're when you're basically saying we're going to outlaw them 2035. It's because, you know, that you have to say that in order to dissuade a lot of people who would otherwise have picked a much nicer and better car for them to say, no, you can't have that because of climate change. Now, again, if this was an incredibly effective way to fix climate change, maybe we'd be willing to say, all right, well, you've got to give up on your on your fossil fuel car. But as, as you just quoted from my book, we're basically talking about a tiny bit. Uh, just to give you a sense, of the 140 uh, million cars uh, is uh, right now the world has about 7 million electric cars. So it's a huge jump. Uh, now, can we get there? We possibly can. But remember, uh, by 2030, we'll probably have almost 2 billion cars uh, uh, on the planet. So it's still a fairly small bit. Of course, again, if they keep being cheaper and cheaper and more and more effective, maybe people will switch in droves. But what we've actually seen is the only way you can get large pickup on electric cars is by giving people lots and lots of subsidies. The country with most uh, sold electric cars, Norway, they actually give you a subsidy that implicitly is almost as big as the price of the entire car. So you know, not surprisingly in Norway, unless you really, really need an elect uh, a gasoline uh, car, you will buy an electric car. But remember, most of the people who buy it, buy them as the second car. So they drive it when, you know, when you just have to go a little bit and then they have their gasoline car for the real trips. Oh, interesting. Yeah, and in, in, in America where there's, you know, when it subsidizes the whole thing, obviously, um, it's really just the wealthy that can afford it. I mean, and, and then and then you end up in, in California is just, I, I worry greatly that California could, is, is the baseline policy metric for the rest of the United States if you're Joe Biden. Uh, in California, the electricity prices go up six times higher than the rest of America. Um, their gas prices are, are way, way higher. Um, and, and again, for, for what? What are they really doing for the environment? Oh, not much. Um, people, are, people are fleeing uh, for now uh, because they have a place to flee to, which is generally Texas. And, um, and it's, it's, it's not good. It's especially not good for the lower income folks. I mean, because look, a lot of high income people living on the coast, they don't really pay. They're not even looking at what they're filling up their tank at. They're, they're not even, they don't actually look at their electric bill. It just gets paid automatically, um, you know, on auto pay once a month. They're not actually looking at it, but there's plenty of other people who actually calculate this every single month and are worried that they mm. can't even pay it. And so they notice an extra ten dollars or an extra twenty dollars, um, and, and 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 what do they get for that higher cost? Well, they get rolling blackouts uh, because they have an electrical grid that's 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 manipulated by by this um, by the by the renewable sector. I, I just don't see any benefit to this. Um, what should we talk well, fun about? Fact in in, in Britain, in Britain, they raised the price enormously on electricity. And they're very, very proud of the fact that they have cut their electricity consumption and also their emissions, absolutely. But when you actually look at who cut, it's not the rich, because the rich, as you just pointed out, can keep affording it. It was the poor. The poorer you were, the more you had to cut. So it's the poor who don't have all the gadgets they like, who don't have the lights they like, who often don't actually have it as warm as they would like in the winter, Whereas the rich just pay up. So the real out outcome of most costs from climate typically falls harder on the poor. They're regressive, which is surprising because that's normally not what the people who are also very worried about climate change would be uh, campaigning for. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think you, you write about that too, right? Um, like different climate initiatives or, or renewable energy initiatives in, in developing countries. I mean, how, how do those generally go? Well, so if you look at developing countries, they mostly need permanent or baseload power. Uh, one of the costly things, and you get this in most developing countries, is that you have power sometimes and then you don't. And so if you want to be a business, first of all, you can't really 
on big production because you know that there's a good chance that it's the power is just going to go. And secondly, you end up buying you know, a diesel generator to back up your, your production. So it's more polluting, it's much more costly, and what they want is more power, and typically that's going to be uh, uh, fossil fuel bread. So for instance, Bangladesh, uh, they they obviously, you know, they sew a large part of the world's clothing, uh, and that's their business. And one of the things that they, so we, we had a, a, a model from uh, UC Berkeley actually, uh, looking at what would be the impact of their, uh, their prime minister has proposed to have a bunch of new coal fire power plants built. That would lead to more climate emissions. It would also actually lead to more air pollution. We tried to look at what are all those disbenefits. It's about half a billion dollars in disbenefits. So that's real problems for the world. And clearly the Bangladesh should, should take that into account. But it would also lead to much more economic growth. It would actually be so good that by 2030, or probably 2033 by now, it would be about 30% richer Bangladesh than they otherwise would be. So for each person in Bangladesh, we find that every time you lose 23 cents to climate disbenefits, you end up making an extra $100 for each yeah. Bangladeshi. There's something perverse about rich, well-meaning Westerners coming in and saying, I'm sorry, because I'm so worried about those 23 cents, you're not allowed to get $100 richer. That's yeah. the real outcome, and that's what we need to recognize, that we can't just imagine that the rest of the world is gonna follow in our, our footsteps. If you become like California and have much, much higher costs uh, on, on electricity, Sure, you uh, you emit a little less, but most countries are not going to say, yay, I would love to emit a little less and have much higher electricity costs. So I want to I also wanna, I kind of want to go back to our, our initial discussion about the, the, the false premises. Um, and, and maybe I want to end with that and then talk about some of the the um, myths out there about, you know, increased super storms and hurricanes and floods and really what's the truth on that. But like. I guess what I didn't ask you before is why do people hype up the catastrophe so much? I mean, what metric are they, are they twisting some statistics? Are they twisting some analytics? Are they using like the tail end of the probability curve and saying, look, this is what we're definitely going to deal with. I mean, what, if somebody wants to refute that, if there's somebody's in an argument with one of their friends, like what's the quick way to refute that and, and, and maybe even persuade somebody. There, there's, there's a number of things to this. So it's been clearly shown that the best way to convince people that global warming is a really big problem is to look at extreme weather. So if you, if you just talk about temperatures are going to be warmer in 2100, which they are because of global warming, nobody cares. Yeah. 80 years from now, do I really care if it's going to be you know seven degrees Fahrenheit warmer? You probably should, but it doesn't seem very bad. But if you could sh somehow show that Hurricane Sandy that hit New York was because of global warming and you're hurting because of global warming, that makes it much easier. So if you remember uh, the big headline on, on, uh, on uh, Bloomberg Business Week was, uh, it's, the co it's global warming, stupid, right? It was that very simple point of saying, look, this is what happens because of global warming. Oh. The reality is that's not what we see. Now, the models tell us that we will get slightly fewer but stronger hurricanes by the end of the century. Fewer is better, stronger is worse. Overall, stronger is a little worse than fewer is better. That's why global warming is a problem. But the reality is, you know, NOAA and NASA and everybody else tells us we can't tell that that's happening right now. But that's not the, the understanding you get from, from the media because, right. of course, you get to see every storm. This is the CNN effect, the fact that you get to see every storm now. You get to see storms nobody ever knew were you know, just idling around out in the North Atlantic and nobody would ever have discovered them. But now yeah. we can see them on, a, uh, on, on satellite and we can give them names, which is one of the reasons why we ran out of names. The truth is, if you actually look at the... Uh, amount of ferocity, so the accumulated uh, uh, hurricane uh, 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 index uh, uh, for uh, globally, which we've done since the beginning of the satellite age in 1980, 
2020, although you probably heard it was one of the worst uh, 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 storm uh, uh, storm uh, uh, years ever, it was worse for the North Atlantic, yes, uh, but not terribly worse. It was the 13th biggest for the North Atlantic, but it was much, much less de uh, devastating in the Pacific, both the Northeast and the Northwest, and in the Southern Hemisphere. So the reality is it was actually one of the weakest years. You don't hear that because that's just boring statistics. You just see CNN and everybody else showing one hurricane after another and talking about how we're running out of names, and it gets a great story. You ask for one statistic that you should show, and and you know there's not that one killer statistic. If there were, again, we wouldn't be having this discussion. But I think perhaps the best uh, one statistic is to show over the last hundred years how many people die from global warming related, so from uh, climate related disasters. So that would be droughts, floods, uh, uh, heat strokes, uh, 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 storms, all these other things. If you take all of those numbers, and we have reasonable numbers for that, and if anything, we probably have underestimated them back in, in, in the early years. On average in the 1920s, about half a million people died every year from climate-related disasters. Last decade, about 20,000 people died each year around the planet. In 2020, just 10,000 people died. So we're actually in a much, much better place. Sorry, I just have to turn this off. Okay. Um, sorry. Um, should I just repeat that or? No, no, you're good. You don't care. We don't really cut. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> okay, good. So uh, anyway, so so we've actually seen a dramatic decline of 96%. And of course, we've quadrupled the global population. So what you see is actually starting in 1920, we've just dropped dramatically so that uh, global weather related or climate related deaths have dropped to an almost zero. Right. We don't see that, but we should see that graph all the time. I'll I'll send it to you, and then you can put it up next yeah. to the uh, 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 to the uh, podcast. Because really, that is the one graphic that really tells you there is a climate problem. It probably will get a little bit worse. We know that theoretically, but because we're a smart and rich society, we are much much better able to handle that. That's why there's not half a million people dying every year. That's why it's just 10,000 people. Yeah, no, that, that's a great point. I mean, because again, you, you don't want to get bogged down in this debate with where, like whether it's real and whether there's an effect. I mean, we can just accept that it's real and that there's, there's some effect, but we do have to fight with the premise on how bad the effect actually is. I mean, like, yes. it, is there a chance some will be more intense? But I, but I also am extremely skeptical when when some scientists or politicians say, well, you know, if it wasn't for our fossil fuels, that hurricane would have had 10 inches less rainfall. And it's like, you know, I mean, is, is that a reasonable statement to make? Um, I, I don't know. I mean, what, what, what do you think about that? Well, so there's there's a lot of you know, modeling that goes into this, and there's some arguments to say that most of these hurricanes are probably a little worse than they would otherwise have been. Now, what is problematic is that you typically only look at where the hurricanes did hit. You don't look at where hurricanes didn't hit because that you know that doesn't really occur to anyone. But we know when we count up the total number of hurricanes that hit the U.S., which is what we have the best statistics for, there's actually fewer, not more hurricanes that hit the U.S. today than there was 120 years ago. It's slightly declining, not statistically significant, but it's not increasing. Then people say, ah, but there are more strong hurricanes. Actually, it's the same thing for strong hurricanes, slightly declining, increasing. So what that tells you is it's very easy to say, look at a specific hurricane and say, that hurricane got a little worse because of global warming. But actually, there's good reason to believe that overall, we're seeing slightly fewer of those hurricanes. Again, this is all in the murky statistic noise of this. And what it really is about, it's about convincing minds rather than being straight with the data. We probably say we can't see anything. Uh, uh, NOAA tells us we won't be able to be able to determine the impact in the next couple of decades 
on on hurricanes. And that's true for most of the impacts that we're talking about. And even then, the impacts are going to be very small because most of what matters for impacts is human uh, decisions. It's the fact that you have better buildings, that you're richer, that you're better protected. And it's also about you know, making sure that you have good uh, uh, forecasting and that you make sure that people leave when there is a strong hurricane. It's also the fact that many more people build irresponsibly and close to where hurricanes hit. That obviously drives up the, the damages. There are all these other things, and they're much, much more important. So when people say, I really care about future victims from from hurricanes, we're going to do something about global warming. They're essentially saying, let's fix this problem by dealing with the costliest but least effective way to tackle the future. That's a bad idea. If you want to help people, make sure you have better forecasting, better protection, and you have people that are wealthier. What also concerns me about them is they're making unfalsifiable arguments, meaning that no matter what we did now, in 10 years, there's a bad hurricane and they're like, well, it would have had 10 inches less rain. But it's like, you don't, you know what I mean? And you can never be wrong. That's what I, an unfalsifiable argument, I think, by definition, is a logical fallacy. Okay, so let's end with this question. Um, if, if, if we can't get around uh, blowing out our budget and, and, and forcing our, our children and grandchildren to live in, 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 in just up to their necks in debt, and we're going to spend $400 billion a year here in the U.S. on climate change initiatives, what would be the best use of that money to not just for climate change, but for just general environmental concerns? What would what would be your, you know, I don't know, top three? Yeah. So there's no way you can use 500 billion or 400 billion smartly. Uh, that's just too much money. Uh, so I would <laughs> oh, argue that you got You got to come to the Congress should, of the United States. We, it's like, you, you should definitely be spending more money on research and development into green energy. Again, Biden is uh, promising $85 billion. Uh, right now, the U.S. spends $10, 15000000000 billion. So ramping it up to 85 is yeah. probably going to be really hard. I think it's a good to ramp it up to 30 maybe even to 45, so tr double it or triple it. But you know, quintuple it is probably going to be really so hard without money. a lot of waste. Yeah. That could be the best way to tackle global warming. It could also be the best way to tackle a lot of the other problems of humanity. Because remember, the reason why global warming conversation is so important is because it addresses how we get energy. And energy is how we get rich. Uh, right. This is the whole industrial well, revolution. Well, can I ask a follow-up so to that, though? So, like, which, yeah. which which parts of renewable energy? I mean, what 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 should we really be researching? Is there anything specifically? Because so, you got so nuclear, you got I carbon capture, a, carbon utilization, solar, it's wind, very battery. What is say it? green energy? not just renewables, right? So surely we should be spending money on, can we get better solar? Can we get better wind? We should spend it on, can we get better batteries? But we should also spend it on, as you just said, can we get better nuclear? You know, uh, it's a travesty that we have a lot of uh, uh, drawn up plans for fourth generation nuclear, but they're not built in the US. They're typically built in China and elsewhere because it's just too costly to get regulatory oversight uh, for these projects. That's silly. We want to make sure that these uh, get investigated. Now, they may not work. We want to find out if they don't work, but maybe they're going to be fantastically cheap and incredibly safe, which is what the proponents are proposing, we should be investing in that. And then we should be investing in a host of other sort of slightly crazy ideas. They're not crazy in, in and of themselves, but they have, you know, they're long shots. So Craig Venter, the guy who cracked the human genome back in 2000, uh, he's thinking that we could make algae produce oil on the surface of the ocean. They would simply soak up uh, 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 sunshine and, you know, they'd essentially be floating uh, solar panels that soak up sunshine and CO2, and then we could just burn them in our cars. This is not at all cost effective right now, but he's saying maybe we could investigate it to a place where it would be cost effective. There are lots of these kinds of slightly crazy schemes. And again, you know, most of them are going to fail, but that's fine because we really just need one or a few of them to succeed, and then we would power the rest of the 21st century. So the idea, I think, should be we should have blue ribbon panels set up. What are the most important research projects that we could discover where we could make a significant step towards fixing 
the climate problem and getting cheap green energy. That would be a lot of different proposals. And then we'd use these National Science Foundations, a way of allocating much of this money would be very cheap because researchers are cheap. But the cumulative effect would be that we would have a much greater chance of fixing climate change. And we'd get, you know, the great cell phone battery and all this other stuff at the same time. Besides that, we should be focusing, for instance, on getting China to frack, because if we could get China to coal to gas, that would be you know, much, much more than we could really reasonably imagine to be able to do over the next 10, 15 years. It would also improve Chinese life quality because it would reduce uh, uh, Chinese uh, air quality uh, problems dramatically. Again, this would not help the U.S. at all because it would all be in China. Well, but they, it well, would they could buy, but they could buy our natural gas. We'd love to sell it to them, so it would help us quite a bit, actually. Well, I, I, I know, I know, but it is very expensive to transport it. Uh, so, you know, in the long run, it is much more realistic to imagine that China and India and everybody else <laughs> would start fracking themselves. So, helping the world uh, to frack, and then of course recognizing that if you actually want to get clean air and clean water, there are many other ways that would be more beneficial in the first place. Clean air, mostly about making sure that the world's poor don't use terrible fuels to cook and keep warm. So about 3 billion people cook with dirty you know, fuels like wood and cardboard and dung and whatever they can get their hands on. It's equivalent to smoking two packs of cigarettes for every one of those 3 billion people. That's almost oh. half humanity. That's about getting them out of poverty. That's not about any you know, climate proposal or even environmental proposal. It's about making sure that they stop being poor. Remember, 150 years ago, your you know, great, great, great grandparents probably lived in the same kind of, you know, it was dirty, it was smelly, it was terrible. You had terrible indoor air quality. We got out of that because of energy. Life. And we yeah. the same thing. Yeah. Well, but, you know, cheap energy that you have not inside your house, but that you have from a power station, for instance. Right, so right. There, there are very, very simple ways to do this. Then of course, outdoor air pollution, it's about scrubbers and coal-fired power plants. It's about making much cleaner energy. It's about making sure that every, uh, uh, every car has a catalytic converter, that you don't have so many mopeds. All these very, very simple things that actually have very, very little to do with the standard arguments of climate change these impacts would be fairly cheap and would have immense impact for most people. But of course, they don't look as good on TV. Yeah, and none of the things you just listed are on the plan, which is very frustrating. Um, well, except yeah. for the research and development, but uh, but that's more of a Repu that's more of the Republican answer that they're just you know they're fine with it, but it's but it, it's not as flashy, right? Uh, okay, well, last thing, plastics in oceans. Um, have, what, have you seen anything? What, what's the most promising solution to that you've seen? Um, you know, I, I get it. This makes my heart hurt. I don't like envisioning plastics in the Pacific Ocean. It drives me crazy. I also happen to know that, you know, transitioning to paper straws here in America is is a completely useless tactic to combat that. I always ask people, I'm like, when you throw away your plastic straw, where do you think it goes? And they're like, I don't know. It might go to the ocean. I'm like, no, it doesn't. Might it's not might going to the ocean. Okay, <laughs> it's it's not going to the ocean. It goes into trash dump. We live in America. Now, but that being said, tons and tons and tons of plastic and trash are going in are going into rivers and into the ocean. And most of those are in Asian countries. Is there any technology or ideas that that we could combat that with? Have, have you seen anything on your radar? Again, the answer is incredibly boring. It's twofold. It's not these big contraptions out in the Pacific Ocean. It's about getting good municipal uh, 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 trash mm. treatment, yeah. especially in Asian it's, countries, it's, in it's Vietnam and yeah. Philippines, and certainly in China. Those are very, very simple things to do. They're not simple. They're actually costly and hard, and we've spent a long time doing it. They're not rocket science by any means. That's what you need to do so that, you know, when you throw out a plastic straw, it goes into, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, the garbage treatment just like it does in rich countries like the U.S. The second thing that you need to do is to make very sure that you don't do too much recycling in the U.S. This is, this is a surprise to many people. Why is there so much plastic in the ocean? Because a lot of rich countries, the U.S., but many, many other countries, decided we were going to recycle a lot. 
it actually costs a lot to recycle. So what most people did was they collected all this plastic. They didn't know what to use it for because honestly, it's not all that great quality, most of the plastic. Mm -hmm. So they sent it to China and to the Vietnam and Philippines and other places to get it, uh, 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 you know, supposedly get it treated. But if you've just bought a whole barge full of plastics, gotten it from the other side of the, uh, of, of, of the Pacific, do you treat it really costly or do you just, oh, I think it slid into the ocean. Of course, a lot of this just got dumped in the ocean. That's where most of the plastic that is in the ocean actually comes from. It comes from it comes from fishery equipment. So, you know, that actually makes up about 30, 50 percent of it, uh, according to, to surveys. But a lot of it comes from us sending our, uh, recycle plastic to other places that don't have good recycling systems. And then let's not be surprised that it didn't get recycled. It got dumped in the Pacific. So, again, this is about making smart decisions. First of all, make sure that they get good municipal uh, uh, waste treatment. And secondly, make sure that you don't just send your environmental prom problems elsewhere. Probably the best way, and this is also very controversial, and that's a whole other issue. Probably the best way is simply to burn the plastic, do it responsibly, regain the energy, and actually get it used. In, and you know, we do that in Denmark and Sweden. It works very well, and it's actually fairly low impact on the environment. And you don't have that huge extra cost of actually needing to tackle it. If you want to have that extra cost, I think it's a bad idea. I think there's lots of evidence that shows that. But if you want to do that, you have to pay that cost yourself and not ship it to Vietnam. So just burn it. Interesting. So, yeah, because I, I saw this, um, I think it was in Denmark, uh, this like ski mountain of trash burning. Is this true? Yes. Is this yes. a thing? I mean, I was like, yeah, I yeah, saw yeah. it on Instagram. Yeah, and I'm like, there's no way. And I'm like, I'm like examining the picture. And I'm like, is this, is this real? And it looks, it's apparently real. It's a really, it's a giant building with a ski slope on it. And uh, they burn trash inside of it. <laughs> I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. So it's incredible. It's a very famous architect. He basically made this fun extra statement. It's not. It didn't cost all that much more. So you know, it's a great thing. You you even heard of it. But it. But underneath is a place where you burn a lot of trash. And remember, trash can either be used as a way of you have lots and lots of people standing there and picking out all the different things that we can use for different ideas. Now. Some recycling make good sense. We've recycled about 30% of copper since 1900 because copper costs a lot of money. It's easy to drag out of, of, you know, especially building materials. So we recycle it. But lots of things are worth almost nothing. And so when we recycle them, like we, for instance, try to recycle paper and plastics and bottles, those are typically really, really bad things because they're not worth very much, but they're really hard to recycle. So instead, you just burn them, you create energy, and it actually heats homes, and it produces electricity at the same time. That turns out to be a very effective and very cheap way of getting extra energy, extra electricity, and get rid of the plastics. So you know, that's just one way of doing it. But again, it's about not being stuck in your mind of saying there's only one right way to do this but saying, you know, what's actually the smart way that's both good for the economy and good for, good for the environment. Imagine that. Solutions that make sense and, uh, and work. Okay, anything else to add before we, before we end? We got, I think we covered a lot. <laughs> I think we've been around a lot. Yes, no, that's great. Jordan, always, always good to have you, man. Appreciate it. Appreciate all your good work. Um, I'm, I'm excited to have you. I'm probably doing this a lot more. I am now on the environmental subcommittee for the energy and commerce committee. Uh, so this is a big deal for me and we got to, we got to get it right because uh, we're talking about spending a lot of money on the wrong things that just don't have the benefits that people think they'll have, but they sure do feel good. So uh, appreciate you setting the record straight. Hey, thank you, Dan. Let's talk again. We'll do. All right. Have a good one.